like the groundedness of the talks until now um, uh, I'll, hopefully i'll continue in the same flavor and uh, i'll talk uh, a little bit about our experience uh, doing feature engineering and what has uh, helped us do it a uh, little bit about us uh, unlike the previous companies very uh, we are very small uh, we are a company called uh, scribble data we are an ml engineering platform our users are data scientists and we do a lot of uh, um, training data set generation for the data scientists and this is the, i'm i'm summarizing the lessons uh, that we have learned doing feature engineering uh, at uh, two large scale large not of the uh, moon frog or uh, dream 11 and uh, their scale but uh, for most uh, uh, organizations and uh, our customer base is not the new age uh, technology companies but uh, the old school retail companies everybody and their brother is building up their uh, data teams and this is experience from uh, deploying this uh, uh, our tooling and learning the process of uh, feature engineering and the key message uh, is that uh, uh, productionization of ml is actually very expensive and if you deconstruct it and look at it very closely we know the elements that are driving these costs and therefore we can go about it very systematically and uh, address it and we have personally seen a 10x productivity improvement and i would like to share the few things that we have done to get to that uh, level uh, okay so while they uh, set this up uh, just to give you a sense of uh, how expensive it is uh, um, if you look at today's uh, the, the ml engineering uh, teams work starts after the data engineering work ends that means the data is uh, delivered through kafka into your lake hive hbase whatever it may be from there it goes through a series of transformations and you generate matrices that are input to the models and then there is a separate step of actually model survey just for my understanding how many of you are data scientists here okay data engineers okay good mix so we are talking about talking to the right audience uh, so the and and it happens in in stages because the input data volume itself runs into terabytes and terabytes and you have to bring it to a point where you can feed your scikit-learn or your spark ml or whatever whatever it may be and you need to do this reliably the expectations of the data scientists also have been changing in the last uh, two three years um, the output the expectation today is that you are able to build these models and put into production and actually improve the kpis like uh, Govind was talking about. The expectation is not that you will impress me with your wonderful new algorithm. The meter has to move forward, right? Yes. Okay. What do you mean to say? Okay. Oh, can I can use? No, I can't use this. Okay. The yeah. Is there a way to project it properly? Because I, okay. Yeah, sorry about that. Now, uh, this is uh, a picture uh, from the uh, both uh, their blog as well as recent presentation from the Uber's team at Fifth Elephant in August. Um, the this system, just to give you a sense. Uh, it took about uh, 20 plus people over a period of multiple years to build these things and get them right. And what they do is essentially drive 5,000 models. And what we have consistently seen over a period of time is that one, the moment you put the first model, the second model, the third model, I mean, there is a proliferation of models, there is a proliferation of use cases, there is a proliferation of pipelines and so on. That is, that's what starts building up uh, a, a lot of this uh, complexity. And why do you need uh, so many pieces there was a very interesting paper uh, which I totally love from uh, Google uh, sorry the attribution is missing here uh, this is from uh, 2015 uh, neural IPS uh, uh, conference where they talked about where does their effort go at Google right 
And uh, uh, if you look at uh, this picture, the ML code is this, this black box in the middle. Everything else is about making sure that this box actually is being fed properly. It is computing the right things uh, and it's doing consistently day after day after day. And it, the entire uh, Uber's uh, 20 people team uh, is essentially making sure that all of these pieces are running all the time. And if you deconstruct it further, what, is, what are all of these pieces achieving? The first thing is speed. The uh, point is that we, uh, every day we can imagine new use cases and new models. We need to be able to put them into production. And data scientists are in, under increasing pressure to productionize whatever models because it translates into direct uh, business impact. The second purpose that all of these boxes uh, achieve is correctness. Because of the statistical nature of the computation and the world being very complex with all of its uh, nuances, uh, it is very hard to get an ML model right uh, continuously uh, over a period of time or for all uh, corner cases. So a lot of uh, uh, this work is going towards making sure that this, this is working as per expectations. And if there are deviations, keep correcting itself. The third one is evolution. The assumption that we have is that the data scientists actually know which model to build uh, ahead of time. But there's a huge learning process, right? Because you have to discover a lot of tacit knowledge and constraints and uh, assumptions about the world, about the process, about your own system deployment and so on. So this, this thing is, enables you to deploy many models, many versions uh, of the models uh, really fast. And finally, operate, uh, you know, uh, drive a lot of data through this ent entire system. I'm going to focus on one uh, particular uh, uh, problem in this. Uh, the rest of the pieces are for a future talk and something that uh, um, we, we are thinking a lot about. Um, let me zoom into that. This particular step feature uh, extraction Sorry. Uh -huh. So this is essentially what it's doing. There are billions and billions of rows of detailed uh, events that are coming in and it has to be translated into a large matrix. And this mapping could be as simple as a arithmetic uh, operation or it could be running a full-fledged model itself to derive one of the columns. For example, this could be the predicted uh, uh, spend or affluence category, whatever you could infer. E there could be a model driving each of these columns itself. And you have to do this. I mean, this is typically a one is to thousand uh, uh, compression that is happening between this point and this point. And uh, because of the, the complexity of this step and the large volume uh, of uh, the data that we are dealing with, it never happens in GetCo. Our computations at our customer, for example, this, this process is a 12-hour process, right? Even for a, a, not a very big data set, and we are not even talking about Google, Google scale. And this has to run every day, because uh, essentially it is generating uh, for every customer. There are new customers every day, they do new transactions. So this feature uh, uh, matrix, uh, if you will, has to be updated every single day. And it doesn't happen in, in one step, it happens in uh, uh, three steps, you know, roughly mapping to the scale of the data. There is one thing that consumes the last one year's worth of data. It's probably terabytes. It will run in batch mode and it will run every week or something. And then there is something that is near time. This could be last 24 hours, last seven days, and then there could be last few minutes. And the feature engineering, if you will, this mapping of the actual transactions to the matrix happens at all of these three levels. And once the matrix is available, you feed it uh, either offline, depending upon your modeling strategy, or online, right? And uh, the output of this model is the one that is actually served through an API to the uh, end uh, application. And what we have observed is that once you set up the first model, this quickly proliferates. Because we are not limited by the ideas or the limited by the use cases. We were, the, the most amount of uh, friction uh, or the slowdown 
was in putting together uh, this messy process. So when you, um, uh, this is uh, uh, traditionally done in-house in uh, big firms like Flipkart. They have entire uh, ML engineering team which is doing all of these things. What has happened in the last one year because of the growing importance of this, um, uh, all of these uh, companies uh, who have built homegrown systems have come out and talked a lot about uh, what they have done as well as uh, new offerings have come from uh, big uh, uh, data engineering uh, names as well as there are some newer uh, players entering who are just focused on that particular, uh, this particular competition. And I would strongly recommend uh, looking at some conceptual work that is uh, done and uh, this is, this is, uh, there's a great presentation by uh, Lowen in the last uh, uh, three weeks or so. You may want to uh, look at it. And uh, Lowen is ex-Airflow committer. Uh, and same is with Vishim. Uh, uh, so the question is, what is it that is making uh, all of these things expensive? The first problem is that you need to have confidence. Today you cannot put a, a model into production just like that. The business will immediately ask, why should I believe this model? On what basis should I have the confidence? And trust is an end-to-end -end property. It is not the property of only your model. If the model is being fed garbage, it doesn't matter that the model is, is great, right? Or whatever, the statistics is great. So the need for uh, and this is a very expensive operation. In the past, what I have found is that when there are uh, mismatches, errors in the computation and you realize at the end, chasing it through the entire uh, pipeline or going all the way to the raw data is, it just burns up time like uh, nobody's business. The second one is that uh, uh, this is continuously evolving system. There is no um, uh, this will never stabilize. This will never settle down, right? Unless you have uh, a very established, very focused uh, use case. In most organizations, uh, there is a proliferation of uh, use cases, proliferation, and of course, the algorithms are every day, there, is, there are new algorithms that are coming in. And there are questions of um, uh, even the, the stability, evolution of the input data sources. A lot of the data that we consume comes from POS systems. And they keep changing, changing schemas, changing uh, semantics continuously. And you have to cope with it. Right? It is not a highly controlled uh, systems like, uh, and well thought out uh, systems uh, in, uh, that were discussed in uh, some of the earlier talks. The third problem is uh, uh, the cost of uh, development, the time and effort that it takes for data scientists to define some of the features uh, that they need. This also is, is uh, uh, not to be underestimated because the features runs into hundreds and thousands. Okay. The last one is operations. This thing has to run every single day. So, uh, invariably, uh, things break down and you have to keep uh, uh, doing a bunch of uh, activities to make sure that the current feature matrix is uh, not, not only accurate, but also available. And if you do it correctly, so we, uh, there was a natural experiment set up uh, in the sense that we did something similar for a tier one uh, food and beverage uh, company in India about uh, three, four years back. This is where my concern and my interest in this whole uh, thing emerged. Um, and we took a lot of the lessons, embarrassments uh, that happened during that time and embedded into uh, the current uh, approach. And uh, this is a comparison of what did we gain and where did we gain. The key thing to remember is that um, given that this is a continuous activity, this is an intensive activity, this is an evolutionary activity, you need to think through this whole process. And there are three, four dimensions along which you need to think through. And if you do that, you are looking at a very significant productivity improvements here. It's a, it's a good use of your time. The first one is uh, trust, right? If you are every day or even infrequently, if you are having questions of whether you believe the numbers that this 
whole pipeline which runs for about 3 hours to 12 hours to several days. If you have ever questions about correctness, you should stop there and start focusing on this. Right? Because it is every investigation of yours is going to be very, very expensive. So building in visibility and auditability, knowing where any data set has come from in your entire system will give you enormous benefit over a long period of time, in my opinion. The um, part of it is, the, if you ask what does auditability require, uh, what does uh, trust require, it involves things like uh, uh, metadata standardization. What, what this means is that any data set that is ever generated in this very long compute process, I should be able to know who generated it, uh, when it was generated, why it was generated, and what are the dependencies with other uh, uh, bits of information in the system. And it should be readily available to you for investigation at any point in time. We do things like uh, linking it uh, directly to the git commit that generated the code. I actually know the commit that generated this code. And this has saved us a lot because we have several deployments, several test deployments, production deployments uh, all over the place. In order to know um, whether something was wrong, um, but linking data with the code has helped us a lot. And this is part of the metadata that we uh, collect. The other thing is that you, uh, the data sets proliferate. Lots of files are, keep getting generated all over the place. And you have to be able to uh, surface that uh, information, knowing, you know, uh, having a simple search interface that says, okay, type out any name, any, can you? this thing please having visibility into uh, all of these processes and the files that they generate uh, is is uh, critical and uh, this has saved us a, a lot of time early warning system by that uh, we routinely see um, uh, data quality issues uh, at the ingestion end because these POS systems they are made by some third parties. Uh, there are not many controls over uh, the incoming data. So very aggressively uh, watching the, the ingest, ingested uh, data as well as uh, uh, very extensively building uh, quality checks is uh, very important. By the time you compute and you feed the model, it is too late. Ideally, you should not even go to the, to go to the model. The last one is, uh, like I was saying, one, one big problem is complexity. Um, uh, there is a proliferation of pipelines, data sets, models, versions, uh, runs with various uh, parameters. You have to have a way to cope with all of them and clearly identify uh, each, each one of them. And so you will incorporate things like namespaces, uh, versions, uh, um, and linking of uh, code and data, and, and so on, right? Clearly isolating the outputs of uh, various runs. And this has uh, helped us a lot to cope with the, uh, the, the volume of the output, not in terms of the number of bytes, but in terms of the number of different uh, files and uh, sets that are, uh, that are generated. So the other thing that has uh, helped us a lot is uh, start looking for abstractions that will uh, give a natural interface uh, for uh, the data scientists. Remember I was telling you how these features run into hundreds to thousands. Uh, imagine a data scientist writing a lot of code. More code is more errors in, our, in my mind. So the question is, what is the most compact way for them to express what they are looking for? Can we create a, a higher level language for them? And uh, we have uh, introduced uh, our own DSL for our customers. Now we have started working on an open source uh, version of it. Okay. A, a reusable uh, platform independent feature specification uh, mechanism, if you will. A lot of uh, reuse. Pipelines are not that different. You should be able to reuse a lot of the development that has been uh, done before. Today, the, the code of a typical data scientist looks like this long, uh, you know, pandas or a spark uh, code. Um, and having, imposing a structure on it uh, to provide reusability is going to be critical. And part of 
one thing that comes out of this reusability and the framework uh, associated with this is ability to test. Um, uh, the, typically these things, uh, what, what we have observed is that um, the, even data scientists uh, uh, sometimes lack discipline as far as um, uh, testing their own uh, ML code is concerned. Having an easy way uh, for them to build a lot of tests, express it and make sure that they are running all the time gives them confidence uh, in their own uh, code. So some of this uh, structure is, uh, is developing. Um, so a lot of this looks like importing what we have learned in the last 30 years with software engineering, right? This should not, none of these things uh, uh, should be uh, a, a surprise. But I think the opportunity at some level is to um, a, incorporate the right abstractions, build the right abstractions starting with the starting point being the lessons learned uh, from the past. Uh, I was talking about versions and metadata. Metadata was not a big thing in the past, but now it will become critical because routinely we handle with, you know, millions and millions of files uh, all over the place, right? And this is only going to uh, increase uh, in, in future. So the last one is because of the resource intensive nature of uh, this computation, you have to keep a watch on what is happening. If there is a 12 hour process and it fails in hour seven, it is very hard to uh, recover. I mean, you have lost a day and, and all the pain associated uh, with it. So um, one of the simplest things that is required is uh, a default integration with a set of tools, right, that are already available that will give you visibility into the performance aspects of your uh, system so that uh, you can understand their behavior as well as uh, debug it. Um, and some of the things that we like is, for example, net data, which gives you memory and CPU consumption. For us, memory is, is, is a big deal because pandas blows up very, very quickly. The moment you cross about 100,000 uh, uh, records. Um, simple scheduling, I want, for example, my uh, data quality monitor to run every hour. Uh, in my data lake, or I, I need some background processes with supervisor and so on. All of these tools are available. A integration, out of the box integration with a bunch of these tools uh, will help uh, the data scientists also understand the behavioral aspects and therefore we can uh, fix the problems earlier. And this has speeded up our ability to deliver this uh, feature engineering almost 10x. We are doing 10x the volume of the data with 10x the number of uh, features with only uh, and uh, half the time that is that we took in the past. It says something about my not having thought through the previous uh, time. That is one possibility. But um, I think these are all good ideas. That have been demonstrated to have value in other, other places at other times as well. So with that, let me leave you. Uh, this is a long topic and um, uh, we will have, I expect that this will be a thread that will uh, come up uh, in, in future uh, again. And there are more elements of this uh, pipeline that we need to uh, discuss uh, as a, a community. And I'm a strong believer in end-to-end -end discipline. Right? Discipline at all levels of this uh, data product, if you will. And I look forward to that conversation. Any questions? Any questions? Okay, so if there are no questions, uh, we will continue the conversation during the... There's oh, that's one there. So, Vankat, you brought an important point about uh, metadata. <coughs> so, and uh, what's your view in terms of uh, industry as such, in terms of data standardization, because your platform seems to be looking into streamlining what comes in before it gets consumed. So maybe you can share your thoughts in terms of what you've seen in industry, what's the maturity overall from metadata perspective? We looked around at met metadata and asked um, what standards uh, exist out there. Today the standards are very small, I mean very limited. In the sense that there is data package, which is done by the journalism community, and there is DVC. All of these have different flavors. So uh, two, three things uh, that I see is that I first see a need for open source tooling for metadata, something that is standardized, used by everybody, whatever be their uh, uh, computation model, R, 
um, Julia, Spark, whatever it may be. The second thing is that we have to agree, agree upon interoperability. That means that the standard has to be shared across uh, people. So part of the conversation that needs to happen is what needs to go into the metadata? What would in you know what would cover bulk of the discovery and auditing needs of, of the customers? Uh, the third thing, in my opinion, is that none of these things can save you if the um, uh, data scientists and the data engineers don't believe in uh, the need for uh, trust in your offering because why do you need auditing you because you want to believe the output that you have right uh, that you are generating so the third one which is a bigger thing in my mind which is an appreciation by the community as a whole for the the need to build trust in the end-to-end -end, uh, uh, service The questions? Okay, thanks. We are open sourcing uh, a tool, partly to, I mean, based on our experience, to, uh, uh, you know, uh, to drive the conversation forward. We would like to see metadata standards. Thanks, Venkat.